If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Joshua uh, chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 16. That's where we'll be today. Joshua chapter 3, uh, starting in uh, verse 3, uh, verse 1 actually is where we'll start at together. Uh, again, it's so good to have you uh, this morning. A couple things I, I do want to say. First of all, we have about 35 of our women, I think 35 of our women, at Lake Williamson uh, this weekend that are finishing off a, uh, a women's retreat. I've heard wonderful things thus far about it, but uh, they'll be coming back this afternoon, so be praying for them on their, their uh, trip back, and that was a, a weekend that God moved in the hearts of, of many of our, our women. Second thing is tomorrow, uh, most of you know, not only is it Monday, uh, but it's Solar Eclipse Day, all right? Anybody got big plans for that? We got anybody with plans? Okay. All right, a few of you guys have some plans. Let me just remind you, okay, because I have not necessarily seen it from anybody here at Copper Creek, but I have seen some things online about this. And whenever these kind of things happen, there are people that are taking some obscure verses from Scripture and saying, well, because of this, we believe the Lord's return or whatever it may be is going to happen. Let me remind you of this verse, Matthew 24, verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Even the keyboard warrior who thinks he knows everything on, or she thinks he knows everything on social media does not know. In fact, it goes on to say, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. He is the only one that knows. So could Jesus return tomorrow? The answer is yes, he could. But is Jesus waiting for a solar eclipse across the Midwest to come? I don't necessarily know that's true. Only the Father knows when he's going to return. So don't waste all your kingdom energy trying to study the book of Daniel and Revelation, trying to figure out, is this the moment he's going to come? Uh, whether it's a solar eclipse or whether it's a blood moon, whatever it may be, we know that Jesus is going to return. We don't know when it is. No one knows. But our job is to be ready when he does return. Amen? All right. Uh, again, we are in this series uh, that we're calling the Great 316s of Scripture. Uh, last week, we looked at John 316. Uh, in fact, uh, Mike quoted this morning, uh, For God so loved the world that uh, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, have everlasting life. We talked about that idea that you must be born again. Nicodemus thought out of anybody that could be saved, he could be saved. In fact, anybody that was about the kingdom of God, he felt like he was about the kingdom of God. But what Jesus kind of blew his mind with his idea is that you must be born again. It wasn't through all of his knowing of the law, uh, following spiritual things. Instead, it was through what we now know as the Messiah, what Jesus uh, did on the cross uh, for us. That is the only way, and this is a spiritual transformation that must happen, not through our works, but through uh, the Messiah we are saved. And so what I talked about last week is there are these passages in 316s all throughout Scripture. And we're going to take the next number of weeks and look at some of them. I want to remind you, these are not inspired in the sense that the chapter and verses are not. The Word of God is, but the chapters and verses, but there does seem to be some mile markers along the way that seem to think that 316, kind of pointing us in the right direction. I mentioned last week, kind of on our trips, you may not know the exact road, but you know mile markers. There's a number of 316s along the way that are kind of mile markers in our faith. Uh, last week was this idea of being born again. Today is talking about this idea of step of faith. After first service, I talked to a woman who's been attending here a long time. She said she's been uh, even attending church for 35 years years and she doesn't recall this story in scripture and it's a powerful powerful story from the book of Joshua we're going to look at in fact oftentimes it gets kind of uh, overlooked in scripture but I, I want to show you and of course as we typically do we're going to look at the surrounding text around it but here's the first question kind of want to get you thinking about but what types of battles are you going through right now just your own personally what type of battles are you going through most likely it's probably a relational spiritual physical, maybe financial, maybe mental health, or for me, a lot of times, it's multiple battles. Isn't it the way it works in life where it seems like rarely do we not just like, how are things going? Everything's great. You know, most of the time, at least in my own life, there's different battles, and it seems like when, we, when one battle's over, a next one begins, all right? So we never want to get too confident. Reminder that in this world, you are going to have troubles, and it seems like around every corner, those are there. But Paul writes uh, to uh, uh, basically his son in the faith. It wasn't actually his physical uh, blood son, but Timothy. And here's what he writes. It'll be on your screen. It says this. And I love, he uses different action verbs along the way. He says this, but you, man of God, talking to Timothy, really this is an encouragement to him. He said, flee from all this. Now, he's not talking about flee from life. If you look in the, the context of Scripture above it, it's talking about uh, some of this love of money or false teaching. He said, like, flee from all that. Don't have anything to do with it. Don't even argue about it. Just flee from all that. And he says, instead, I want you to flee, and I want you another action word. I want you to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight. I like 
don't just stand. I want you to fight the good fight in, of the faith. Take hold of eternal life. Like, take that strongly in you to which you were called when you, when you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So there's this idea when we're fighting these spiritual battles, we're not just like taking it. You know, there's this idea of standing. We're standing firm in his word. We're standing firm in his uh, commands and his precepts and what he gives us. So that is how we're to fight uh, these battles. Today we find that this where the Israelites are in this. Let me give you just a little bit of background before we jump into the text. Israelites, we know the story uh, in the Red Sea where they cross the Red Sea and they, they are heading towards the promised land. They're heading towards Canaan. Remember what happens? They send these spies. If you were in children's church growing up, ten were bad and two were good, if you know the song. all right. And two of them, Joshua and Caleb, says we can absolutely take them. We can take them. With God's power, we can absolutely. The other ones are like, no way. They're too big, they're too strong, the, the, the grounds are good, but they got these fortified walls. We cannot do it, so they go with the, the majority, and the Israelites stay, and they wander in the, in the desert for 40 years, close to 40 years. In fact, so much so that all the adults are to die off, except Joshua and Caleb. Nobody else is going to see it. Children might, might be able to see it, but the adults would not be able to see it. So here we see them again, on the precipice of going into the, the promised land. And uh, Moses is now dead. Joshua is the one that's going to lead them into uh, the promised land. And this idea today, last week we talked about this idea of being born again, like born from above, that God is doing a work within us uh, that, you, that you must do to be born again, uh, to, to enter heaven, to uh, be part of the kingdom of God. Today we're talking about this idea, and what I'm really imploring you towards is this idea of taking steps of faith. That faith is just not this intellectual thing. It's not just, yeah, I believe in God, and so therefore I'm going to live my life saying I believe in him. It's actually about taking steps of faith, steps of trust along the way. Here's what Hebrews 11:6 6 says. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who earnestly seek after him. So today we're going to see a story of the Israelites having to take uh, this step of faith, and then an encouragement for us to do as well. So we're going to dig into this text today. Before we do, let's take a moment and let's pray together. Father, you are good. We thank you for this opportunity we have today to uh, be able to study your word. Um, I, I, I say it all the time, but, but what you have to teach us today is far more important than anything else we have on our schedules today. So I pray that uh, our hearts are open through your Holy Spirit to teach us today, wherever we're at in our faith. I know there's some in here that are still curious about their faith and not sure exactly what it looks like. And there's others who have been following you a long, long time, who are standing firm in their faith, who are, um, who are not turning back. And I pray today would be an encouragement to them to take those steps of faith uh, towards you, trusting you, trusting your goodness and trusting your love. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Four things as we look at this text together. Number one is this. Now we're going to start with the F. Number one is follow the Lord. Follow the Lord. Let's look together at Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 uh, through 4. And again, if you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in front of you. We want you to have that Bible, our gift to you. Otherwise, it'll be on your screen. Uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, it says this. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before uh, crossing over. And after three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving them orders to the people. He says, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Now, they've traveled. I, again, I, I assume your geography of, uh, this, uh, this, of this land in the Middle East is not, is not great. They traveled 10 miles, basically from Shittim to the, 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 the waters of the Jordan. So they're probably tired after this, this trip they've gone on. There's a large amount. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly how many Israelites. Sometimes we picture a smaller amount. I think probably in a, around 2 million people. I've heard estimates in the high hundreds of thousands to higher millions that were there. Lots of Israelites there. Here they are on the, the precipice of crossing over the Jordan. But what we know is, and we'll see later in the text, is it was, it was flood season, which means a couple things. Not only the water is going to be higher, but the waters are going to be much more intense. Crossing the Jordan becomes much more difficult, and they're, they're on the edge of it wondering, what are we going to do? The Lord said he's going to lead us into this promised land, but what are we going to do? How are we going to cross this? Is the Lord going to build us this bridge? You know, are we going to have this massive like boat to cross it? How are we going to do it? Are we going to walk on water? I mean, Jesus hadn't done that yet, but like, how in the world are we going to get across? We don't, we don't know that at this point. 
but the Lord has them on the, the edge of the Jordan, looking across it, knowing they have to cross the Jordan, just like the spies had to. They had to cross the Jordan. The difference is, is it wasn't in the flood season, and you didn't have all these people with them. So they, they have these big, a, a massive obstacle in front of them. And what you notice in the verse 3, he says, when you see the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, the Ark of the Covenant, your blank there, your first blank there on, under this, is represents God's presence uh, uh, for the people. It's God's presence uh, for, for the people. Uh, in the, in the past, they've had him as a pillar of the cloud uh, in, in day and night, this fire. But this was actually the presence of God. It's not that they necessarily thought that God lived in the box, but this was their presence. Now, we'll show a picture on the screen. This is not actually what it looks like. It's been destroyed uh, since by the Babylonians. But it looks something like this. And the priest, you'll see, this is kind of a picture of the priests are carrying it across here, uh, the, the, Jordan, the Jordan River. There are no selfies at that point, so we don't have what it looked like. But it looks something to that, to that uh, caliber at this point. And so they're crossing over. This is kind of this golden rectangular box with these angels kind of on top of it. Inside the box, there were a number of things. You had the Ten Commandments that were placed in there. You had manna. You remember manna was provided uh, for the people. You had, uh, you had Aaron's staff in there. And again, they understood that God didn't live in that box, but yet God was represented by that box uh, for the people and as they were traveling. And basically, the, the concept was this, is you're to follow this Ark of the Covenant. That's what they're to do. Basically to say you're to follow the Lord's guidance. And, and we already see in this passage here, in, in verse uh, number two, it says, after, th uh, after three days, the officers went throughout the camp. And so they're waiting there three days, seeing this obstacle in front of them. Like thinking, how, am, how are we ever going to get across this Jordan River? Like probably even talking like maybe, you know, maybe like there's no way around it. We've got to go through it, trying to figure out there's no way. We're all going to die. The Israelites had a propensity towards complaining. And I'm sure they were complaining, thinking there's no way we're ever going to be able to cross this. The obstacle's too big, too far. They're waiting for three days. And I don't know about you, but when you're anxious and you're worried and you have to wait three days, a lot of bad thoughts go through your mind, don't they? Not a lot of thoughts of faith. And so they're having this moment of thinking, there's no way we're going to be able to cross this, waiting three days. They haven't just been waiting three days. They've been waiting a lot longer than that. We know that uh, from Numbers chapter 22, they've been on the this plains of Moab for uh, some four to five months. And we know they were wandering for 40 years around the desert as God's punishment to them. We also know 500 years earlier, God had promised through Abraham that, that he was going to make them, uh, the, give them this nation. He was going to give them Canaan. And so there was all this waiting that happened. And there was a lot of nervousness uh, amongst the people at this point. And again, I mentioned would have been probably felt like for them impossible to cross the river. Now, what we know is, is that from this point, if you look at verse number four, it says, do not go near the ark. Well, why not go near the ark? Well, again, we're now in the new covenant, it's a lot different. We know that we can boldly approach uh, the Lord. Uh, we can boldly because of what Jesus did for us. But there was this awe, there was this honor at that point. They were not to get near. In fact, they were supposed to stay, uh, they were supposed to say a number of cubits, 2,000 cubits away. And I assume you're a cubit, uh, you're, uh, I'll be able to, to say how far that is. It's probably not too good for you. You probably don't know exactly, but that's basically like a half mile away. All right. Almost, I mean, about a half mile away is how far they needed to be away from it. And again, it could have been the awe, it could have been that. But also, if you think you got two million people, if everybody's huddled, I think of yesterday in St. Louis, there were all these people for soccer match, for um, uh, there was, what else downtown yesterday? The Battle Hawks played, the Cardinals played, all these people, not even near two million. Can you imagine if they all got next to it, they could not see it? So there's this idea of everybody staying far back so everybody could follow the ark of the Lord as they go across it. So again, a thousand yards back, about a half a mile back, this reverence and awe that is there. And recognizing in verse number four, uh, it says, uh, says, then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. Like This is all new for them. And oftentimes when we're in new terrain, there's fear. There's uncertainty, like we don't know. We know that the God has given us this land, but he didn't give us all the blueprints. We don't know exactly how this is all going to happen. We know this is really scary before us, and we know that the Ark of the Covenant is supposed to lead us, but we don't know any more details than that, and I'd imagine at this point there is great fear among the Israelites. They don't know exactly what to do, but they know at this point they are to follow uh, the, the Lord. 
Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Many of you guys know this. I learned this growing up at BBS, but this idea of trusting the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge or submit to him, and he'll make your path straight. The problem for us and the problem for uh, in this, this room is it's really easy to kind of trust in the Lord or trust in ourselves and lean on our own understanding. You know, sometimes even in our faith we do that. Like, well, we know I've seen God do this in my life or I've seen him do that, so this is the way God's going to work. And who are we to say how we know God's going to work? We don't know. We, we know things about God's character, but we don't always know how God's going to work. God can work in, in so many ways above and beyond what we think, and even more than we can even imagine. Even his love for us is, is greater than we can even imagine. And so we, we don't know, but we often do trust in our own ways. And there's a danger in trusting our own ways. You know, oftentimes when we are like trying to figure out what are we going to do in life, in our career, especially as you're in that college or young adult place, we're thinking, well, what, is, what am I want to do? What am I going to do? One of the questions should absolutely be, maybe the first question is, what does God want me to do? Like, I don't want to just lean on my own understanding because my own understanding is probably going to lead me in a wrong direction. Lord, lead me in the way that you want me to go. Lord, I don't want to take a step without you. Now, we're talking about that at midweek right now, what it means to follow the will of God. The other end is we don't want you to live in fear. Like, we don't want you to think, well, I'm never going to do anything unless I have 100% confidence that God wants me to do that. I don't think that's the way we should live either. Certainly, we should follow what his desires are. The primary way we know what the uh, the desires of God are is word. All right? It's not through dreams. It's not through all these other things. It's through what does his word have to say. It's not even through conversations with other people that we respect. His word is the primary way he communicates with us towards what he wants us to do. And so we can, we can come in this place where we're just paralyzed, thinking we're not going to do anything because we don't know 100% certain, but there's this trust that God's going to lead me in that direction. And oftentimes, I think that God will get me back to where he wants me to be. And so we should be asking the question, Lord, what do you want me to do in this? Not just the big things, but the small things. Oftentimes, you know, it, we think, well, like w- the biggest thing God could call me to do is go be a missionary someplace. Well, and that may be. That's a big calling to leave everything. But there's a level where on a daily basis he's calling you to sacrifice. He's calling you to die to yourself. Those are the things, those small decisions are the ways that enables us to make the bigger decisions for God where we might say, I'd never be able to do what this person did. My guess is that person was able to act in faith because they were faithful in these small ways along the way. And so in everything we do, we are to follow him. We are to trust him is, is in what he calls us to do. In fact, this next blank is this. Christians should follow the Lord because he alone knows the way before us. None of us in this room know what tomorrow's going to bring. We might know we're supposed to go to work. We might know that there's a, a solar eclipse party. We might know those things, but we don't know what the day holds. We have no idea. It's new terrain for us. This was new terrain for the Israelites. So they had to, at this point, say, we are going to trust because our own knowledge will not get us past this Jordan River. We'll be stuck. We'll be stuck here or we'll be floating down that river because we have no way of doing it on our own. We're only going to trust him, which leads to the second thing. Number two is fully commit to the Lord. Number two is fully commit to the Lord. Let's look at verse five together. Here's what Joshua told the people. So they're all ears uh, to what's going on. Joshua told the people this. He said, consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. We don't often, you know, uh, say the word consecrate yourself, do we? We don't really use that, that language. But it's, it's more this idea of like almost ready yourself spiritually. Ready yourself spiritually. Prepare yourself spiritually. In in the Old Testament, we see it through a lot of different ceremonial cleansings. If you read through uh, the book of Leviticus, which I know the book of Leviticus, for many of you, was the death of your Bible reading plan uh, this year. I I get it, okay? But I'd say make your way through it. But there are all these these, uh, laws that were given. And certain things they could touch and certain things they couldn't touch. Part of it was this understanding of like... Of on the outside, we are unclean, but in, in the, what we see in the New Testament is the idea, it's, it's not just the outside, it's the inside. And so they were doing these things on the outside, but ultimately what God was using this outward sign to show us how un, inwardly we are so unclean. And so there's a part of us that needs to consecrate ourselves. Now, that doesn't just mean like, for us, that doesn't mean just like take showers, although I generally think I'm a fan of showers, you, you probably should take showers or brush your teeth or those types of things. But it's more the idea of how do we ready ourselves? If I was to ask you the question, how did you ready yourself for church this morning? Most of you would probably think outwards wise. Like I, you know, again, I, I brushed my hair or I, you know, did this or did that. But the question is, like, what did you do inwardly? 
don't know about you, but it, it seems like it happens all the time on Sunday mornings when my heart's trying to be prepared for worshiping. It seems like so many distractions come into place, don't they? Or, you know, whether fighting or frustrations or whatever those things are that can get us off track. I think Satan wants nothing more than distract us, keep us busy on that. But what he's calling us towards is ready ourselves. Because here's what I love. Look at verse 5 again. Look at your Bibles. He says, God is going to do, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Now, what is that amazing thing? They don't know. They have no idea. Whether Again, whether God's going to cause them to, God's going to build this bridge, help them walk across the water, we don't know. But God is about to do amazing things, so ready yourselves. You know, I wish we had that. Uh, mindset as far as when we come to worship him. You know, I need to ready myself. Lord, I'm going to ready myself. I'm going I'm to read your word. I'm going to use these different spiritual disciplines. We think of like fasting and some of these other things that we do. Not so that we get brownie points with God, but so that he, it's a vehicle for us to grow in our faith, grow in trusting him. And so it's basically ready yourself because God's about to do something so big. And so what we see is, is they did that. Now the question is asked like, well, what if they didn't do it? We don't know. Because they did it. They trusted. They said, okay, we're going to ready ourselves because God is going to do something big. They knew they were punished. They knew that the Israelites were going to wonder. Now this is their opportunity. They didn't want to wonder any longer. They wanted to go into this land that was promised to them. Even though it was scary, they wanted to do it. So they readied themselves because they knew what God gave them is so much bigger. 1 John 1 9 puts it this way that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You know, I've, I've heard the statement before, well, why, why do we need to confess our sins? Like, if God is all-knowing, he's omniscient, he knows everything, why do we need to confess our sins? Like, he already knows. Well, isn't there a part of us that when we confess our sins, there's a, there's a uh, part of our heart that is contrite, saying, Lord, I, I don't want to do these things. Like, I trust that you've forgiven these things in my life, but Lord, I want to bring these to you. I want to confess these to you. I don't want this to be part of me. I don't want this to be part of my character. Lord, I want to, I want to change. I want, you to be re, I want to be remade in you. And so there's this part of us that humbly comes before him as the God of the universe saying, I need you. I, I need you. Again, it's almost like a, a child and a parent. It's not like oftentimes, especially as a parent perspective, it's not like the parent doesn't necessarily know what that child has done. Their fingerprints are often all over it, literally and figuratively all over what they've done. But yet there's a part of me that when that child comes and, and confesses, there, there's a part of, there, that there's a contrite uh, spirit that, that is so desired. And recognizing that coming to our Lord and saying, Lord, I don't want any part of this. This is preparing of the heart. D.L. Moody, uh, you may know him. He was a, a theologian and an a, a, a evangelist. He, uh, th- there was a, a phrase, he heard a phrase before, and this was the phrase that it says this, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated or fully committed to him. And that was the phrase he heard in church, and I guess the phrase after that that he said that's, that is uh, credited to him is this, by God's help, I aim to be that man. To say it this way, like, I can't imagine if there was a man that was totally dedicated what God could absolutely do. And he's saying, I want to be that man. And what we know about his life, what we know about D.L. Moody's life, and I'm sure he would want the glory, obviously he's passed, but he'd want the glory to go to the Lord, is this, is that, is that it wasn't his own glory, but over a million people, because of some of the ministry he did, came to the Lord. Saying this, like, what would happen if we fully dedicated ourselves, we fully committed to uh, the Lord. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says it this way. It says this, therefore I urge you, Brothers and sisters in Christ, in view of God's mercy, we should offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. This, this idea that there's this justification idea that w- there's this one-time decision, we were made right because of what Jesus did, but then there's this daily sacrifice, Lord, I'm living for you. And we say it up here all the time, the problem with uh, sacrifices, living sacrifices, is we tend to get off the altar, right? We tend to say, Lord, I'm going to live for you on Sunday, I'm ready to go, I'm ready after church, I'm ready to do whatever, I'll run through a brick wall, I will do whatever, I will surrender all my life, and then Monday morning comes along, and we're selfish. And we want our own things, and we want our own kingdom, and we want it, my will be done, not his will be done. And so that's why it's important, it's proper, 
daily saying, Lord, I want to offer myself to you. Lord, whatever I can do be for your kingdom, to your glory, to your, honest, uh, to your honor. I want to seek first your kingdom, and all the other things will be added as well. All these other things will be taken care of. So on, in your own battles, you know, are you, are you ready? There's a part of us that we need to be cleansed, there, that confession. There's a part of us that confessed up, Lord, Lord I, I have lived this way. I don't want to live this way. And, and dedicate, Lord, today, I want my steps to be about you. I want you to be glorified through whatever I do. Here's your, here's your last plank on number two is this, is once you make this commitment, God will use you in ways you never dream possible. And that's about what's going to happen to the Israelites, which leads to the third thing. Number three is, is faith in God. Faith in God. Let's look at this in verse six. Joshua said to the priests, he said this, I want you to take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So we have this Ark of the Covenant amongst all these two million people. I bet you, basically want you to go to the head of the class. So they took it up and went ahead of him. Verse 7, and then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. You will be my mouthpiece, basically, to say that. Verse 8, tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the wa of Jordan's waters, go and stand in the waters. And Joshua's going to be thinking, like, that's your plan at this point? I just go stand in the waters? That's it? Verse 9. So Joshua kind of calls the Israelites. Obviously, he didn't call all of them, but he probably called some of the leaders of them. They come around there. Verse 9 says, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the, and I have it underlined in my Bible, living God among you, and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, each from, uh, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordans, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. And so God's about to do this miraculous thing. Doesn't give all the details of the how, why, but trusting in him. Trusting that he's going to go before us. Uh, there's a story told from World War II. There's a, a special squadron known as the Pathfinders. There's a picture of them up there. And the, the special squadron, if you know anything about history of World War II, they would go before all the paratroopers, and they would go kind of behind enemy lines. And before they would either uh, drop the people off that would battle or they would drop bombs off, these people would go and they would set up different lights or, or, different, or different lights down there or they would set up different flares there to know exactly where they should attack. This idea for this, for the, for, the, uh, for the Air Force to be successful, they need to have people go before them. So these pathfinders were with them, and oftentimes they, their, they, their lives ended. Their lives were basically sacrificed in order for the plans to be successful. This generation had to learn that God was going to go before them. Again, they've been walking. They've been walking a lot. They've been walking in steps. They, their step counter would have been so high because they kept walking and walking and walking. Now they're going to walk differently. They're to walk in faith because God is going to go before them, and they see this in, the, in this Ark of the Covenant that's going to go uh, before them. So no longer walking in flesh. And again, verse, look back in your Bibles at verse 9. It says in verse 9, I'm sure the Israelites were ready to go. They were ready to go. It says, Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. It's basically to say this, like pause for a moment. Like I want you to hear these words. So often, man, we just want to go. And he's like, stay with me because I'm going to lead you. It's not going to be your own understanding. I am going to lead you. And reminder, this is how you will know that the living God, your blank, your next blank there on, under number three is living God in comparison to the idols made of stone that the different, and we, there's seven different ites that are listed there, is different. These, these weren't living gods. This was the true living God, and this living God would guide, this living God would lead. And so here's your next point. God will give us this miracle today to remind us that we can trust him tomorrow. How many times in your life that God, I wonder God has given you something to say, hey, I'm giving you this so you can remember that you can trust me. We're going to see a, 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 a exact uh, uh, specification of this idea in just a moment where the Israelites are called to do something to remember what God has done, us, done for us. But that's one of the powerful things about journaling, or that's one of the th powerful things about looking back to see how faithful God has been in the past. And if you can recognize his faithfulness past, how helpful is that to recognize how faithful he will be in the future? 
God has been so good. Some of you guys can see that in your life. And you've seen how God has, has led you in a very dark season. And that helps give you the power to say, I know that he led me then and he'll lead me now. Not necessarily the way I think he ought to, but his ways are better than my ways. And I'm going to trust him. And so there's this recognition that the Israelites are ready to go. But before they go, they have this conversation. And you think the, uh, the priest fearing, because again, their battle plan was this. Step in the waters. That doesn't seem like a great battle plan, does it? But for God it was. He's like, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, in faith, step in these waters. And again, this idea that sometimes, you know, when we're going through battles, it's not like God gives us a picture to saying this is exactly what's going to happen. More often than not, what God does, at least that I've seen him in my life, is that God gives me a little glimpse of saying, okay, this is what you ought to do. Be faithful in this, and then I'll give you the next step, and the next step, and the next step. And that's what we ought to do. Faithful with what we know to be true. Faithful to what we know we ought to do at that moment. Not always having the big picture, but trusting him in the very small ways, which leads to the very last thing, fulfillment of the Lord's word. Fulfillment of the Lord's word. And this is where it all happens. This is where we see the great thing that happens. Look at verse 14. It says this, so when the people, they broke camp. Think of a couple million people here. They're breaking camp. They crossed the Jordan. The priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went on ahead of them. So it's happening now. They've been waiting all these years. They're about to cross the Jordan. They're about to cross in the Promised Land. Verse 15, now the Jordan is at flood stage and at all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. Notice it was a step of faith. They, they, the moment they put their foot in that water, the water stopped. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of the Zarathon, while the water flowing uh, to the Sea of Arabath, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. Again, I'm assuming your geography in this area is not all that great. It was actually stopped 20 miles away. That's how far Adam is from where they were. So here's the crazy thing. They couldn't see that. They couldn't see what was happening. They didn't have anything, they didn't have a camera over there that they could, that could fly a drone over there and watch what's happening. They just had to trust because they had no idea. They had no idea how the water was going to be stopped, but they know the water was stopped. They didn't get to see it, but yet they were able to see that the water had stopped. Verse 17, the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan, and they stood on dry ground. While all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. This would have not been a thing a few minutes here and there. This would have been millions of people. It would have taken a long, long, I mean, potentially even uh, hours and days for all these people to cross over. And again, there's all these people who have tried to describe how this happened. How, like, was there some kind of natu uh, natural uh, thing that happened, or earthquake, or you know, some other way the water was dammed in? But here's what we know: First Corinthians, or First Corinthians, uh, Joshua four, verse eighteen says it this way: And the priest came up out of the river carrying the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And here's it's cool: No sooner had their feet on the dry ground than the water of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. So is it a coincidence? I don't think so. The moment their, their feet hit, hit the ground outside of the Jordan River, the water came back again. So much so, if you look at Joshua chapter 5, verse 1, it says this, When all the Amorite kings west of Jordan and all the Canaanites kings along the uh, coast heard how the Lord had dried up uh, the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their, their hearts were glad. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't. It says their hearts melted in fear. And they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. They were terrified. Because they knew it wasn't on their own understanding. They knew that the, it was the Lord's work. It was the Lord's hand. And only could be explained in that way. There was no other explanation for it. And that's why we see in Joshua, as you continue on, as the Lord leads the Israelites and really punishes these nations from falling away and for doing things uh, evil away from God. God used the Israelites to punish them as they get the land that had been promised to them all the way back at Abraham. James 2.26 says it this way, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. There's this idea in James chapter 2 that talks about faith and works. And really this idea of certainly we are not saved through our works. But if you are a believer in here, there should be works. There, sh there should absolutely be things like, again, as, a, as a, a healthy tree produces a certain type of fruit, we should produce these, these deeds. 
And if there is no deeds produced in your life, if there's no natural outpouring of Christ in your life and you, sh you sharing and you loving and caring, then I would question, then I'd question, is your faith for real? Because that faith, now again, never done perfectly, but you can't, you can't disassociate the two. If there is faith, there must be deeds. And then we move on in Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It says this, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, can you imagine like, what they would have felt at that point? So when they do this, the Lord said to Joshua, to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up the 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests were standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So they'd have these probably larger, I would assume, these river rocks. And they could know and they could carry those with them as a reminder this is when the Lord led us across the Jordan. You might have something uh, that you reminder, whether it was a, a journal or a time that you remember that God led you out of this. And every time you see that item, it reminds you that God led me out of those things. I don't know what that is for you, but these stones, again, it's not that God was telling us that we have to carry these stones and he's starting this new idea like what we do in communion. He's not trying to start that, but it's this idea that God was faithful to us. He led us across. There's no way, particularly during the, uh, during the uh, storm season, there is a flooding season, there's no way we could have got those stones except and apart from the hand of God, that he gets the glory, that he gets uh, the honor in this. And notice in verse 17 again, go back to verse 17, this idea, and that while all Israel passed into the whole nation, and they, 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 oh, they completed it by, draw, uh, by crossing on dry ground. Not swampy ground, not, not muddy ground, but dry ground. That it was only God's hand that led them. But the Israelites had to take these steps of faith, right? And there's for us as well, like God is, is working. He's working all over the place, but yet there's a call to us to live in faith. Now, I, I, th I think it's interesting. Again, I was t uh, having that conversation with a woman after first hour. She wasn't aware. Most of us are aware of the story of, of the Red Sea. When God leads the Israelites out of Egypt, it's got movies, you know, Charleston Heston. And, you know, you've got all these, uh, you know, Prince of Egypt. You've got movies along those lines. This one is kind of forgotten about it a little bit more where God actually brought them into. In, so the Egypt, he brought them out of Egypt. And this one, he brings them into the promised land with, with a miracle. But the question is, is what did the Israelites have to do to overcome their obstacles? What did they have to do? Did, did they have to come up with some great plan and say, okay, God, here's our plan. This is what we're going to do. We're going to draw it out. And Lord, this is what we're going to do. Do you think it's a good one? No, no, no. What you see over and over again, actually, 14 different times in the short 17 verses, you hear the, you see the phrase, Ark of the Lord or Ark of the Covenant. It's referred to over and over again. And what the scripture says there and, and here is that they must look to the Ark of the Covenant. To say it this way, the power wasn't in this box, but the power is within God. The power is within him. And some of you guys are facing a pretty big obstacle. And what you may have attempted to do is with your own understanding, with your own knowledge, Lord, help me. I'm going to get out of this. And Lord, I'm going to kind of add you the equation for good luck. No, no, no. It says, seek him out. Seek his kingdom first. In fact, here's what scripture says in Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 2. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us. And the sin that so easily entangles. Let's stop there for a moment. A lot of times we use this verse in funerals. And people say, since we are crowded, uh, surrounded by this, this great cloud of witnesses, and you almost get this picture of like, have you ever been at the end of a marathon and everybody's cheering you and hooting and hollering? You've ever been in that moment? Maybe not running in that moment, but maybe you've been in the crowd hooting and hollering at that moment. And there's this idea that uh, oftentimes, especially in funerals, we'll talk about this idea that as we're living this Christian life, that there are those in heaven that are hooting and hollering, like watching us and kind of figuring out what's going on in our lives and, and, and going for us. And while that preaches well at a funeral, I don't know that's necessarily true. Again, I think the moment that when people die and they're with Jesus as a believer, they are with Jesus. I don't, again, I don't think they're not necessarily in that place, the new Jerusalem that's talked about in Revelation 21. That will one day, uh, we will go there all together. But they are with Jesus. And to be with Jesus, Paul even said, is better than being here on this earth. So they are in this place with Jesus that moment. I don't know they're, they're watching down on us every move, every move. I think the idea more is this, is if you know Hebrews 11, it talks about by all these people, like Moses and Abraham and David 
And all these, these men and women of faith in the Old Testament, Paul, and in the New Testament, who lived out this, this faith in such a powerful way. And saying, because they lived out this faith, because of their witness, you should do it as well. It should encourage us to do it. So it's not as much that they're, hoop, they're hooting and hollering from us from heaven, but it's this idea that you can follow their example as I follow. And Paul even says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So as I look at Hebrews 11 and look at all these people who live by faith, it should give me the, the encouragement to myself live out in faith as well. And then it goes on to this point. It said, let us run with perseverance. Don't quit. The race marked out for us. And what are we to do? Remember like the Israelites were to fix their eyes on that Ark of the Covenant? What we're to do is to fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer. He's the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I wonder if the worship team come on up here. So, so this, here's, the, here's the idea. What are, you, what are you facing? What are you facing? I started the question, of what types of battles are you going through? And again, my, my trust is that all of us in this room are going through different battles. And here's what I want to tell you. Here's what I want to encourage you towards. A lot of us, when we go through different battles, we'll, we'll try to kind of put our nose to the grind and do what we know to do best. But what Scripture tells us is that's not necessarily, it doesn't mean we don't work hard, but the idea is that fix our eyes on him. Trust him. As he guided the Israelites, he will guide us as well. Not always in the way that we think he should, but again, the trust that his ways are above our ways. And so sometimes we're facing some pretty scary things in life. Again, whether it's medically, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in a financial way, whatever those things are, the easy thing for us to do is sit there and worry and sit there and, and, and say, God, I don't know what to do. But what God tells us to do is fix our eyes on him. And I wonder if some of you this morning, as you come in today, you've got your eyes on these problems, these struggles, and you're scared, and you're concerned. And again, just because you fix your eyes on Jesus doesn't mean the problem's going to go away. But what he promises us is that he, he's, his love for us is never failing. It doesn't end. He will walk beside us. He'll walk with us. It's this idea that, he, that again, that, that we are to, to, to come up under him and we are to, to follow him, to interlock ourselves with him as, as he walks and leads and guides and directs us. That's exactly what he did for the Israelites. And that's what he promises to do us as well. What we can say is that we're going through these storms, but I've yoked myself to him. I've trusted that he'll guide and I will follow. Where he leads, I will go. I don't want to take a step without him. That is the way that he calls us to live. But we can't do that unless we've made him Lord and Savior. We've trusted him to say, Lord, I want you to take the lead. Lord, I want, to take, I want you to be the guide. I'm not the one guiding my life. You are Lord of my life, which takes surrendering, which takes repenting to turn away from what he has called us for what, for what we want to do in our own self, our own carnal nature, our own natural way of living instead of saying, Lord, I'm going to follow you and follow you, I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn away. Lord, I want to trust in you. I want to follow what you've called us to do because I know you will guide. I trust you will direct me. Some of you guys already have, uh, you already have that relationship. But you're facing some pretty big battles right now. Like Jordan's right in front of you. And you know that you're going to be crossing it. But yet you have no idea how I'm going to cross this Jordan. Saying, Lord, I'm going to trust in you. Lord, I don't know what that looks like, but I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to trust that you are going to lead this path, that you're going to light this path, and I'm going to go and follow you. I'm going to fix my eyes on you. And some of you just need a church home. Again, one of the wonderful things about this is that I guarantee you all these millions of people that are out there, they weren't all ready to go. But they watch these leaders. They watch Joshua. They watch these priests. They watch all these other leaders saying, we're going. And they're saying, okay, I don't know, but I'm going to go. I'm going to follow the example of the other around me, down there, around me this positive peer pressure of saying, Lord, I'm going to follow you. And that's what we get to do. We have people in this room that have been following the Lord for a long, long time. And they can't answer every specific situation you're in and every specific problem, but they can tell you this, I've trusted the Lord, and he's been faithful. And as God has been faithful in my life, he can be faithful in your life as well. In fact, he's not just faithful, he's the only thing. Everything else in life will disappoint. Only he is truly So we're going to have time to make a decision. If you need to make a decision, would you come as we stand and we sing together?